I, I have uh, Andre, excuse me, Andrew, who, uh, who uh, said he has some questions for me, and quite a few of them. Remember, said he did, he, uh, you said they, you didn't know if we'd have time to get to them all. Uh, I'm gang. Go ahead. What, what, have, what have you got and why? Awesome. So um, I want to talk to you about some things, particularly in the investigative methods of modern science, particularly in the fields of uh, taxonomy and biology broadly as a discipline. And then if we get the chance, I would also like to ask you a few questions about kind of the educational system in the United States. And I know you have been quite vocal about your opinions, at least in the instances of, of text and education, but I was just wondering for a, a broader opinion as well as some clarifying remarks on that. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so my first question for you is particularly in the, in the field of taxonomy, kind of what is what do you consider to be the naming threshold between different species, at least to my very uh, limited understanding, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the species is kind of influenced by its environment and the kind of transformative abilities that it has under certain circumstances of natural selection. But uh, at least, at least from my perspective, I, I'm just conceptually confused when we sort of talk about life as a broader notion that encompasses all sentience. But then on the other hand, we also use taxonomy to sort of delineate unique species or kind of trace a, a tree of how these, of how these species kind of interact with each other as, as far as kind of like a family sort of resemblance idea. So I was just wondering what are the delineation thresholds as far as identifying one species from another? Well, the, the criteria is different depending on the type of organism because yep. you know, life plays by its own rules. And we know that uh, some plants are sexually reproductive, but the, when they are, they behave differently than sexually reproductive animals. And we have animals that can switch back and forth between sexual reproduction and uh, asexual reproduction, in which case the criteria will be different again. And microbes generally, uh, especially prokaryotes, have their own kind of classification system where they, the rules are different, a different set of criteria. So if we were talking about asexual reproducers, then we would be looking at a buildup of a particular traits, like a, uh, depending on the organism, we would be looking for a, a measurement of uh, do we have enough unique criteria to identify this as a, as a separate species. With sexually reproductive animals, it's probably the easiest rule to go by is you know, whether they uh, uh, not only can, but will uh, reproduce sexually with uh, another member of, a, of, a, of an adjoining population. I mean, are they chemically interfertile and also inclined to go that way? Because we've noticed that we, a lot of hybrids that we would get uh, will happen in captivity situations where they, where they don't occur in the wild. And Again, the rules are not always hard and fast because uh, if you look at dogs, for example, I mean, dogs will mate with everything, including your knee and a football. But uh, if you look at um, like coyotes and wolves, then we have to take in the environment into account. And if, if, they're, if, they're, if they're a threatened situation, very likely they would breed with dogs where they wouldn't have like a century or so ago when there was more, uh, more open area and they weren't under such stress. I hope that Helps. Yeah, that does answer the question. Okay. Okay. Um, secondly, this is kind of slowly going into the more um, social oriented questions. For example, uh, do you do you think that there is something else uniting the human species aside the physiological similarities that we have? Well, I, I don't know what the something else would be. I mean, uh, it, we, we we have a commonality to us, obviously being the same species, but even if we were not, even if there were two species of humanity, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to think that we would still have some communication, although, you know, obviously past history of our species has uh, has indicated otherwise. I don't know that we necessarily killed off all the Neanderthals. I know that that's, that's a concept in dispute. Uh, but it may have happened, and it is a fact that we are the only species left. And in fact, worse than that, we are the only race that is left. And a lot of people will not realize what I'm talking about here because they think that there's some undisclosed number of human races right now, but in fact, there are not. Uh, just as I said with the criteria of trying to identify different species of, uh, of uh, 
asexual reproducers, we have something similar when we're trying to identify what, it, what is a race. So we can look at a genome and we can identify that, let's say uh, up 100,000 years ago, maybe a little bit more, uh, there were four races so far identified genetically that we found genetic material in, in a couple of, uh, of fossils from however long ago that, that, I, that identify uh, Homo sapiens, of course, Homo neanderthalensis as a, a sister species or subspecies, the, the, the delineation is uncertain there. Uh, and then we have uh, the, I can't, I can't believe, I can't remember what the, what the, what the name of that other race was. I mean, these are, these were not, these were, these were in that transient period where they're, where they're, they're not quite, an, it's like a subspecies. The old classification for what a, a race is was like a subspecies category. And I can't believe that I can't remember the name for what that other group was that was D Denisovans. Okay. So, so the D Denisovans, and then there's another one, and I don't know if they have a name for this one yet or if, it's, if it has escaped me. I think they didn't have a name for it when I first read it, and they do now, and I don't remember what it is, but there was another one that was identified in the genome of Melanesians, so that you can identify just as um, everybody but sub-Saharan Africans will have a small percentage of, of, homo, of uh, Neanderthal DNA, up to 4%, and the reason for this is because of the migration out of Africa. Uh, Neanderthals did not live in Africa. Neanderthals did intermix with uh, Homo sapiens when we made that migration through uh, the Middle East, so forth. So everybody, and, and this, this covers almost everybody in the rest of the world, came through that channel and interbred a little bit in, when, when all of our populations were very, very small. So everybody has up to 4% Homo uh, Neanderthal, Neanderthal DNA, except for uh, Sub-Saharan Africans, whose obviously their ancestors did not go through that channel when Neanderthals were there. Um, but they're, they've identified a similar genetic signature in Melanesians that there's another race of people re uh, recognized genetically that we don't have any physical evidence for at all, not a, not a single fossil, but we have this, this genetic signature. And, and when it's to that level, when you can identify that there, there is another mystery race here, that I think is going to qualify for the race category where we don't have that for the, the any, for what our, our current concept of race or however many, whatever number of people, uh, whatever number of races people want to assign is really invalid. There's, there's no truth to the, and in fact, Darwin was the first one to point out that, that although there were scientists in his day that were arguing about however many races there are three, six, 12, 63, and he went through a list of, of, of all these different scientists and, we, and the, the estimates they were giving. And he said that there's no truth to any of it because depending on where you are in the country, you can, you can see these populations blending into each other with no hard divisions between them at all. And we have those hard divisions genetically between those four that I was just talking about. Is there any sort of evidence perhaps external to the justification of these Melanesians, perhaps some broken arrows or, you know, Neolithic or paleontological cave paintings of any sorts or? Well, there, there have been some things that have been attributed to Neanderthals that were later decided that they, 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 these must not have been Neanderthal artifacts. They must have belonged to Cro-Magnon or whatever. So, I mean, with artifacts, when we're talking about a division on the race level, where we're not even talking about full on species, then I don't think we, there would be any way that we would be able to identify those. When in the case of this, this one race that was indicated by Melanesians, this was something that nobody ever even suspected. You know, we, we, uh, we get out the, the ability to, to run everybody's 23 and me and find out what, you know, what all your genome is. And then we find that there's a whole other category that's hidden in the genome that indicates that there was another race of people uh, in Asia that we have no physical evidence for at all. And Denisovans are kind of fascinating because that was like a single, originally, I think there was more now, but it was originally, it was a single finger bone in this cave and they found genetic material in it and they ran the uh, genome on it. And they realized, you know, they're trying to figure out, is it a, is it a Neanderthal? Is it a, is it a sapiens? And they realized it's neither, that it was something else. And, and how, how do you have like one single finger to represent 
an entire race of people. And we know where those where those people had to have been. And now they've, they've since come up with more evidence. Um, and I don't remember what the specifics on it, I'm sorry to say. But they, they do have a bit more evidence. But still, for, for an entire race to be represented by so by so little evidence and we and we know the the, the breadth that the, those people must have covered across like you know into siberia from from uh, on the boundaries of europe or for, from at least the middle east into into siberia it's quite an impressive range for people that we've never found nothing not a single fossil for until that finger would you say that there was not sufficient genetic variation for them to sustain intergenerational reproduction and pass on their genes consistently over no, centuries? I don't, I don't. I don't think that was the issue because okay. these, these people would have had to have, have had to have spanned from, as I said, the same corridor of of the Middle East, like say Israel or whatever, even right when you get out of Egypt, and then spreading not into Europe but into uh, into Northern Asia. And I'm not entirely sure about what the range on the Denisovans are, but we know a, 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 a swath of it. I, and I think that what, um, it's just a matter of population mechanics. I think that the Denisovans were just a, it eventually replaced. Right. Yeah. Okay. But what it indicates to me on, on the issue of race and, and when you, at, going back to your original question about what holds us all together, is that it is a sad thing that we we divide ourselves the way we do. I mean, we find any kind of division we can to, to make enemies out of everybody else. So if there are physical features that differ, that, that make you recognizable as part of, part of one group or another, then we have a tendency to isolate those people, but rather than being inclusive of them. And I would like to think that we've gone past that, but you know, clearly recent history has shown that no, we have not. Yeah. And this is this has apparently been a problem for our species for quite a long time. Okay. Um, I would um, just briefly like to ask you something about non-human animals, uh, particularly. Do you think that at least the more intelligent animals display some sort of behavior that we can categorize as agency? To a degree, yeah. I mean. Um, it's it's funny to me when people say that you know we are the only thinking animals and yet we, we can tell when your dog is dreaming right i mean you know, there's obviously thoughts going on you know when when you when you see the dog trying to trying to like run in his sleep or or try to bark in his sleep as, as sometimes happens we, we know that there's thoughts going on in that head and it's just the the amount that it's capable of and one of the things to to remember when in this is helpful when uh, people learn multiple languages and you discover that when you have, let's say a different alphabet and a different set of words, a different set of um, like multiple words for one thing where another language will have only one word for that one thing. It does change the way that you think about, you know, th the, the way you were raised in your language is if you are going to have a different kind of impression of thinking than other people do who have these different structures of words. Now imagine that we don't have words at all, you know, not, not, not written, not spoken. We have no language. How do you convey even to yourself an idea? Think about this. How would you analyze any situation? You're watching people's behavior. You have no language at all. You've got no little tiny voice in your head in which you talk to yourself. Because, you know, when you try to work out anything, and it'll sometimes express where you find yourself, you know, verbally talking to yourself sometimes when you're trying to work things out. But I mean, you're doing it all the time in your head. Whenever you're trying to figure something out, you're explaining that thing to yourself. But if you don't have the language skill, how would you even do that? And so... Animals could be quite intelligent, but if they have no language whatsoever, how are they going to convey that? How are they going to analyze your behaviors? They're, the way that their brains are structured for, to think and analyze things is going to be completely different than the way ours are. And it, uh, it's, it's a sad thing that we have some uh, a couple of brilliant species. I mean, elephants, I think, are quite profound. Uh, and obviously, uh, cetaceans, you know, dolphins and whales uh, being very brilliant. They can understand our language. And we can't understand theirs, but yet we're we're superior. <laughs> what they have is not language in the in the sense that ours are. I mean, our languages obviously evolve 
uh, as a perfect analogy for the way biological or organisms evolve. Our languages evolve in a very similar fashion and evolve very quickly. But uh, that's obviously not the case with uh, cetacean languages. There's, there's, there's a different structure there, and we haven't identified what it is. But it's still a situation where their, their environment is so limiting to them. They don't have hands. They can't manipulate things. They can't use tools. They can't, they can't perform the slightest um, chemical experiment. I mean, how do you light anything on fire when you're a dolphin, right? So there's, there's no way to do chemistry. There's no way, to, there's no way for them to expand on the intelligence that they have. And they have all the tools for it, except for the fact that they don't have hands and they, and they live in that environment where they, they can't go further than they are. So they, 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 they won the lottery on uh, mutations enabling them to have larger brains and they have a social structure that also, which is also very important. The social structure is absolutely necessary for building uh, a higher intelligence. But they, if they don't have the hands and they don't have the chemical environment or the environment allowing them to do, you know, some degree of chemi but they can't even bang two rocks together, you know, much less to make tools, then there's a limit for how far they can go. And so there's a lot of there's a lot more limitations on getting to intelligence that, than people may be aware of or or ever realize. And so it's it's actually not surprising that we're the first to to get to this point and that there, there's not a plethora of other, you know, sapient races on this planet. Sure. So some some of the things that uh, that uh, fascinated me during your your answer were specifically on the dog kind of dreaming and us as external observers having the capacity to ascribe some sort of you know sophisticated cognitive activity to whatever is, is going on. Um, but then how how could you say that they experience some sort of language or proto language or primitive language of sorts though at the same time they don't have this or the other way around they have thoughts but they don't even have these sort of skills for for a primitive language so then what are the sort of uh, stimulus responses that we can we can observe if they're not some sort of proto language yeah uh, i wanted I remember when I, I remember when i was a kid i wanted to to envision uh the uh, that elephants and dolphins and, and parrots uh, and other birds communicated with each other with a language, but I realized that there's something that is the, the same set of sounds that is genetically coded to the entire species and it, and it doesn't evolve the way human languages do. I mean, in 2000 years, we went from Latin to not having Latin anymore, but replacing that with Spanish, French, Italian, Romanian, Portuguese, and so forth. So we know how fast languages evolve and that's not happening with any of these other species that have verbal communication so whatever they have going on wouldn't qualify as a language the way we define language mm -hmm. even if it is a verbal communication that, that they understand in much the same way yeah and the other thing that that grabbed my attention was the the idea that when you learn a new language you have different kind of associations, internal associations with the external reference in some way. So th do you think that one of the implications of that is that uh, translations are impossible in, in the sense of, you know, if I'm thinking more of, you know, Quinean's kind of radical translation and so forth in the sense of, you know, if, if I think in Romanian that there is a window and then I think in English that there is a window, there's different kind of mnemonic associations that, that my brain is making. So would that mean that even though the content of, of these, of these uh, sentences is the same, that there's some sort of cognitive or linguistic activity there that means that these don't reach parity? I'm, I'm studying Russian and I thought that Russian was a very complex language and it is, but uh, my wife was trained in Arabic and my mm -hmm. daughter speaks Japanese. So we, we talk about the, the differences in these languages and it, my, my daughter says that you can't do any kind of translation. We're, we're, with Russian, you can do quite a lot. It's not, there, there are some words that have no meaning in English that, you know, like blue, there's two different kinds of blue and that, that would change the way that you view what is blue and, and what is Sini versus what is Gula Boy. But uh, my daughter's description, which she just gave me a couple of days ago about for Japanese, is that we, we have to interpret the general context of what 
what is trying to be conveyed, but that there's no way that we can do a word for word translation. Whereas in Russian, we can do a lot of word for word translations, even though the languages are quite distant. Uh, they're, the Russian and English are a whole lot closer than, than e either one is to Arabic, for example. So perhaps there's some sort of limitation as far as the cultural similarities and the other sort of etymological roots that, you know, so for example, you'd be much likely to have a legitimate translation from Spanish to Italian than from, you know, Mandarin Chinese to English or something. Yeah, like for, for example, in, in Russian, there's one word that that might mean, in one context, it means it would be better to do this, you know, this is the better option, and in and, and another context, it would mean must do this. Uh, if I'm remembering it correctly, I might be confusing it with another word. But you don't ever have a direct one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence. Yeah, it's, it's not like like this word means yeah. this word. It it's like more like this word means this short phrase, but can also mean this other short phrase depending on what you're trying to convey. So, so when, you're, when you're replacing words with phrases, and, and and the context of the sentence depends on what on which phrase you're using. Well, then. It, it's it's a little bit more complex, and you, you certainly can't do a, a straight-on translation of that. Okay. Yeah, my daughter was explaining this this one phrase in Japanese, uh, where she said there's there's no way to translate this at all. She said what this means in English, and I said, well, didn't you just translate it as that? She goes, well, no, really, I didn't, because there's only the, these these characters can convey that this is the thought that that person is trying to say when they say this thing. This is this is what they're trying to convey to you. But all of these other characters, there's no way that, that somebody that, that, that speaks, that grew up with English can can understand these. I think you can't translate all of these others. You just have to take out these one th these few things you can make sense of and ignore the rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find a similar kind of uh, peculiarity when I uh, talk with some of my friends that study mathematics. And they're like, we, we can understand this in the mathematical language and we can re-describe it, we can reformulate it in another sort of mathematical explanation. But if you're asking me to sort of explain you any of these computations or functions or what have you without appealing to some sort of mathematical symbols, then it would likely be impossible to convey the, the content of of the linguistic process going on there. Yeah, interestingly, what I was just yeah. saying, about, you know, the way elephants communicate with each other, or the way dolphins communicate, even though it is verbal, and, we, and this is clearly obvious, we, it wouldn't qualify as a language. And yet mathematics, in, in, in a few senses, actually does qualify as a language, even though it's not verbal at all. <laughs> yeah. And just like language, I, it, it takes a great deal of practice because I, I, I'm I'm remembering things that I took in in college courses uh, like 15 years ago. I can remember the, the vague content of the equation, but I couldn't do it again. It was something you have to do every day, <laughs> be fluent in it, or it's just gone. Yeah, practice and consistency are, you know, keys there. So I would like to move on to a more kind of social social dimensions of uh, of what we are discussing. Um, so just as a brief detour, um, do you think we necessitate religious belief pragmatically? I mean, obviously at that, you know, face value, the answer would be no, but I'm, I continue to be surprised and perplexed to the extent to which religious belief, even with today's kind of technological development, scientific discoveries and what have you, still plays such an influential role in the lives of so many people. And, so many of their decisions are based on, you know, the belief of the supernatural or some deity or what have you. So do, do you think this kind of speaks to some of the, the deeper, you know, evolutionary necessity to equate our existence to some more grandiose figure and try to, you know, imitate the qualities of this figure? Or what do you think is going on there pragmatically? Well, I, I, I do see it differently. Uh, but Okay. Not I don't see it the way that you're describing it, but I but I nonetheless I, I get that the way that our minds are wired, that natural selection is going to leave us more inclined to suspect things that or to to notice patterns when the pattern isn't really real, 
or to uh, to suspect things are there that are not. You know, the classic example of when the grass is moving. If you assume that it's no problem, it's just the wind. Well, okay. Well, if it does happen to be a tiger, then you you uh, were not wary enough, and now you're dead. So the natural selection can favor belief that there's a tiger in the grass, or at least taking caution in cases like that. And I see yeah. there's an awful lot of depth to that question. We could we could spend a day on that. Uh, but one one of the things that that I recognize is that because we are such a social species, we realize that anything we do might be secretly observed. And uh, if we do something wrong, it might be it might be reported. You know, it's like um, you know when you're when you're walking around your house naked, you better make sure that you know, you know you you don't have anybody visiting. You, you make sure you, you did you have a friend come spend the night on your couch last night, and so it's going to be a completely different thing if you walk in the living room naked today because you're not alone anymore. <laughs> you, know, you have to be aware of of your surroundings, even when you don't think there's anybody there. That somebody might see you even when there shouldn't be anybody seeing you. And so you imagine that if somebody can see you, or maybe, maybe somebody is watching you. Maybe it's an admirer. Maybe it's an enemy. You don't know. But the, the safer course of action is to assume that no matter how alone you think you are, that somebody can see you. Even if you can't see them, someone can see you. And apparently, because we're so fixated with ourselves, we think that whoever is watching us is terribly interested in absolutely every little motion we make. Yeah. So uh, it, it comes to the point where we start imagining that, uh, that, that people can not only see us, but are seeing us. And then somehow they would just make the leap that they can also hear what we think. So there's an awful lot to uh, developing gods as opposed to developing a religious idea. But, uh, but religious beliefs procreate through their own sort of natural selection in much the same way that a virus did. Right. The, the, the religion doesn't design itself for this purpose, but this is what works out to be that when you have a collection of people who want very much to believe this thing and they're going to tell it, they're going to tell this lie to everybody and tell everybody you have to believe this lie so that we can, I want to believe this lie. So everybody else has to believe it too, because if everybody else doesn't believe it too, then I'm crazy. So everybody else has to share the same lie. And if anybody doesn't believe this lie, they, they become dangerous and we will kill them on the word of one or two witnesses. So we will just wipe out those people. And then it's real easy to see how uh, the slightest you know, selective pressure will favor religious belief if you're going to kill the infidel. Anytime somebody raises a question or doubts the belief, you kill them. Well, very, very soon you're going to have nothing but believing people. And then you, you try to restrict how much it can change. So you criminalize heresy. But her heretics still happen because evolution, or excuse me, the, the religion evolves just like languages do. So you you start with this, uh, the, the, the Zoroastrianism begets uh, Judaism, and then Judaism branches into Christianity. Christianity branches into a bunch of different things. You know, Orthodoxy and Catholicism branch off. Then Catholicism uh, you know, begets Protestantism, and then that shards off into the Adventists and the, the and the, and the Mormons and the, and you know even though they'll also all of them will say that they're not related to each other we can we can trace how they're all related to each other. Yeah. I'm I'm glad we I'm glad I just kind of straight off into the weeds for that because it's it's better than trying to explain the depth of the whole answer the way I was originally thinking about doing. Okay. Yeah. I I'm I'm glad we we got that out of the way. I I, I mean I have happened to to do a, a degree in, in religious studies and I have to say that I definitely agree with the vast majority of things that you're saying and more often than not I find myself being in a position of an atheist but sometimes I'm just surprised by the kind of potency that religious thinking has for positive transformations also and and I'll get to this in a second I'm not trying to sort of advertise a belief over the other in any way but um, uh, or, or actually, perhaps, yeah, I think it would just be better to jump to this question then, because I think it would just be nicely contextualized with what you were saying. So secular humanism is, you know, by far one of what I would think is the most reasonable approaches to, you know, a 21st century political thinking, practical thought, or, you know, governance and so forth. But I am just perplexed by the extent to which Christianity can appropriate a lot of these values and a lot of these notions and sort of you know, 
the yeah. way the way you know a a good atheist can you know demystify religious belief and sort of kind of decouple these sort of notions from the supernatural into the into into the uh, natural laws and so forth. I find it interesting that Christians can use the same methodology for their benefit as well. So uh, you know, at least in the academic literature, and this doesn't necessarily come from theologians, which I believe makes it all the more interesting, is that there are these people that argue for some sort of Christian humanism where it's like they keep most if not all of the same kind of propositions and values that you know secular humanism would advocate for but then just add like a little footnote of uh, you know religious endorsement in some way or another so I'm, I'm just wondering what do you think uh, about this uh, social kind of appropriation movement and how do you think it impacts secular humanism moving forward well i i primarily identify as an atheist and of course an anti-theist but i am a humanist and and if i were to speak only as a humanist then i wouldn't have a, a whole huge problem in the way that christianity appropriates humanism if in fact they're practicing humanism when you replace thoughts and prayers which is doing nothing mm -hmm. you know, uh, with actual action or or financial donations when you you are pragmatically taking on real world problems with real world situations that's that's what humanism is all about mm -hmm. uh, if they want to if they want to compartmentalize and they just and they appropriate and they don't they want to keep their god in the background that's fine christianity has managed as as a side effect uh, to uh, to produce actual good works on occasion on top of all of the horror that it has wrought because these people are trying to, you know, earn a better place for their God or try to make their denomination look better than everybody else's denomination. And this, and this kind of competition has actually worked for humanity on a, a occasion or two. But I, it, it, it doesn't, as a, strictly as a humanist, it doesn't matter to me if they want to keep the God belief in the background. It's, like, it's much like when I, when I argue against creationism, you know, I, I will I will call on allies in the Christian sphere. You know, there's a number of scientists who are who are uh, brilliant uh, in their field, but they also happen to be Christian, and that doesn't matter because they're they're still advocating for the science. And as long as we stay out of the compartments in which they keep their God, then we're all good. We're just we're just arguing about the facts of how natural selection works, how do genetics work, and all of this. And then I can call on Francis Collins and Kenneth Miller and you know, Robert T. Bacher and, and other people like that for their expertise, and we will all agree on this. And then we will just keep away from those other areas where they have where they hold on to things that I can't understand why they do. Yeah, I think that's the even more fascinating aspect about our cognition. It's that I mean. Having believing and having false belief is one thing, but then having some sort of compatible view of some, you know, kind of appreciation or belief in, in a justified kind of empirical investigation on one hand, but on the other hand, trying to kind of make it fit into a, a broader story of some sort of, you know, religious thinking. I think that's the even more fascinating uh, uh, move that that our brain can make it's that you you there's always going to uh, be that attempt as you said to kind of recognize patterns as, and describe some sort of causality to it in such a way that there's always going to be an explanation for anything and you know that definitely goes beyond any sort of principle of falsifiability and it's always gonna you know leave us hanging with what what then are facts and other sort of important notions for how we've actually managed to intellectually progress forward outside of you know, the dark ages of the church and so forth. Yeah, most definitely. Cheesy science fiction movie uh, it, it called Eight-Legged Freaks. Yeah. That as a side note, yeah. had an interesting yeah. character who's one, who's one of these weird-ass conspiracy theorists who believes all kinds of ridiculous nonsense. And what, what I loved about the way that the, this movie illustrated this character was that everything that would happen would completely comport to whatever his paranoid delusion was already. And so he would just always accept that, of course, this backs up, you know, <laughs> exactly what I was saying, right? And 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 even when, it, you know, and, and, and it never does, actually. It was, it was never backing up his theory, but he always thought that it was. And I thought, you know, the, the movie was not brilliant, but the way that, <laughs> the way that they portrayed one character as a sidestep of the, of the movie, what, what I thought was brilliant. Yeah.
Most definitely. And and I think this is also a good segue to the the couple more questions that I had particularly on the mind before we if we have the time to move into more political things. So what what do you think neuroscience can tell us about the self, about human agency and so forth? You know, there's there's some philosophers that criticize uh, the extent to which these, you know, neurophysiologists, neurocognitive scientists describe predicates to the brain, you know, the neurons are thinking or the brain is thinking. And, you know, they kind of give this example. Well, when we think about a plane, it's not the plane, it's not the engine that flies. I mean, sure, the plane flies because of the engine, but it's the, it's the plane that flies, not the engine. So how do you think these sorts of these sorts of linguistic problems pan out uh, in modern neuroscience and our ability to talk about ourselves. Well, obviously, I, I have no no uh, training in in neuroscience. Okay. Uh, every philosopher I know will will be you know, would immediately jump up and tell and tell you that I had know nothing about philosophy. <laughs> but you know, yeah. since it is you know you you asked me. What I've noticed is is the way that that, that some of these people want to they, they want to protect their view against scientific exploration. They want to say that that uh, neuroscience will never uh, will never understand the emergence of uh, of uh, consciousness, for example, which which to me was never a mystery. I mean, it just isn't. I mean, I. I I can see how how things will you know eventually absorb more and more light and come into more and more focus and it and this is how this is how uh, um, consciousness does also. I mean, if you have any sensory apparatus, we have a protozoa that have sensory apparatus and behave accordingly because of you know natural selection, wiring them the way they do, with no brain, no eyes, you know. But this this protozoa will realize as being enveloped by an amoeba and it will it'll go into a panic mode and try to escape you mm -hmm. know this is and this is an, an a a an element of consciousness and it's just something and no brain at all this is a single celled organism we're not even talking about a, you know, uh, an, an influx of adrenaline or anything like that but it's behaving in a manner like yeah that. yeah and so when we get to multicellular organisms, we have more and more complex uh, uh, configurations like this where they also do have sensory input. Then you have that nerve knot, which is trying to deal with all that information. And when we were dealing with, um, when, we, when we're working on artificial intelligence and, and, and not just that, we were working about on, on self-driving cars. You know, mm -hmm. look at what a car has to go through to understand the difference between the life or death difference between is that a billboard on the side of the road or is that a truck driving sideways in front of me? You know, that, that somebody died over that because a, a, a Tesla misunderstood that, that that is not a billboard. That's a semi trailer turned sideways in front of me. That, that was what the investigation eventually concluded. So. These self-driving cars have to have an understanding of their environment beyond just what their what their senses tell them, and we understand that any simple apparatus. I mean, your your vacuum cleaner. Now we have automated vacuum cleaners that run around on their own. Uh, that they, they have some sensory apparatus and a way to deal with that, and so that they they can understand which direction to go, and then and, and how do they know that they've come to the end of something? They have some kind of sensory apparatus that tells us that that tells them that they've come to the end of this. It's, it's so easy for me to see this as being cumulative and, and coming into sharper, sharper focus. I mean, how much, more, how much light does your aperture take in and how much can you focus it? That's, it's that easy for me. But philosophers want to make it really convoluted or impossible. And it seems there's a lot yeah. of philosophers that just desperately want that to be impossible. And I don't Ooh. think any neuroscientists um, think that it is impossible. I, 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 I think they see it as clearly as I do. I can't speak for them because I'm not one of them. And I don't yeah. talk to a lot of neuroscientists. I've been trying actually to to set up an interview. I wanted to talk with uh, uh, Ramachandran for a good while. I'd love to get him on a, on, a, on a video to talk about the emergence of consciousness. Mm -hmm. I, I dearly want to do. I, and it, it doesn't have to be him. It can be you know somebody of, of similar accolades. 
but uh, obviously beyond my capacity because I want to tap on their expertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, that, that, that's, that's a very good response to uh, the status quo of most, uh, at least to my experience, philosopher and philosophical literature on these sorts of things. We, we, we don't mystify it in, in the same way that perhaps religiosity would, would take an attempt at it. But, uh, but at the same time, we do kind of treat consciousness as this, you know, glow, or this inexpressible, ineffable glow that is somehow, you know, not, not expressible through mechanisms of biological phenomena or its likes. Yeah. Yeah, and it seems that at least in the works of AI, not so much maybe peculiar philosophers, but uh, there's some people that say, yes, this kind of recognition of the external world has been one of the most uh, significant steps that we have done to, to push the technology forward. And the next one would be to be more fully immersed, so to speak, with, with the external world. And in this case, it would mean uh, AI having skin or somehow being responsive to uh, to layers of skin or to, to some sort of sensorial stimuli that would add to the overall embodied cognition outside of direct perception and recognition of external objects. And that would perhaps allow us to move forward with, with how we understand the developments of AIs and, and consciousness and the likes of it. Yeah. And uh, the, b before before we move on to politics, I'm I'm assuming you're also quite familiar with Daniel Dennett. He uh, is is quite quite the biologist, and mm. I was just wondering, what's your take on this hardware software distinction that he's speaking of? You know, in the sense of that somehow the mind is the software for the brain being the kind of hardware mechanisms that pushes the mind to to have some sort of natural constraints based on our respect the physiologies and our stimulus responses and so forth. Yeah. I, I've met Dennett uh, a number of times and uh, I, I think he's a genuine sweetheart. <laughs> he's he's okay. one of those people that, that I just really like. Uh, but anyway, um, it's, it's hard to grow up in, in at this time in history and not think, in, think that the mind works in terms of, of hardware and software. It, it, it's difficult to not to do that. Well, one of the one of the disadvantages of the fact that we are not computers is yeah. that I can take the data that is on my computer and I can I can remove it and I can I can take the operating system and every and all of the all of the saved files and I can move them to another system and I can shut that system completely off. I can take the hard drive out and I can let it sit on a shelf for years and plug it into another system and I'll have all that access again. And when you change the hardware around, the, the programming will work differently. And so the analogy holds up there. If you, if, you, if you were to take your mind out of your body and put it into a different body, well then you'd have different hardware and your software would work a little bit differently. So the analogy holds. But the fact is that we can't shut off and retain that data. It's just like if you're familiar with discharging capacitors. I mean, once the static charge has has ebbed, there's no there's no more information there. It's gone. And so that's one of the, the problems that I have with this is that we've already created a such, such it, the simplest thinking device that we ever manufactured, and it's already better than what we have. Better in the sense that. It doesn't just die and you lose it all. I mean, if you, if you have a if you have a power outage, if lightning strikes, you know, near your house and it shuts off all your power and everything, you may have to reboot the system, but it will boot again. It's not like it's dead and 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 all the hardware is useless and you're going to have to go get a new computer now. You know, but with but with living things, that's mm -hmm. how it is. You can't take your your consciousness. Your consciousness is absolutely inextricable from your brain. Your your mind is the product of your brain, and not as De as Dennett himself put it, it's not from any one part of the brain. It's it's an emergent thing from the collective of the brain. Where I've heard some philosophers say that you know that Daniel Dennett says that Daniel Dennett does not exist because the mind does not exist in the brain. Well, that's not what he said. He he's, he, he said it doesn't come from any one part of the brain; that it is emergent and it's from all of it. 
you know, primary motor functions and, and uh, your, your, your higher intellectual capacities in the gray matter and everything, they're all in, they're inextricably intertwined. They can't be separated. There's no way to stick in a chip and take out the essence of what is you and plug it into a different plug it into a different brain much like it's like that that freaky friday thing where you 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 can't take your mind out of your body and put it into any other body we are not vehicles that that our souls can you know reincarnate into a different one no you there, there's just no truth to any of that mm -hmm. sadly sadly i would love to be able to you know change bodies i would love to be able to treat a body as a vehicle and when when this one runs out, you know, jump into a different one. Mm -hmm. And that's why you know men at my age very often buy those snazzy little sports cars because they're 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 trying to do that. <laughs> okay. Some capacity. Okay, so that was the reasoning behind it. I've always wondered <laughs> what what it, what is it with with advancement in age and the ambition to to have a, a sports car of some sorts. Well, yeah, yeah, there's another aspect to it too. And yeah. the reason that I don't have the middle-aged crazy that a lot of people did is because yeah. I had a wonderfully misspent youth. Mm -hmm. and so what I've noticed, the, the, the old guy who, who, uh, who goes and buys the sports car to try to pick up the ladies again, it's not just that his body can't compete with the sports car he's in now, uh, the sport car because becomes the, like the fancy clothes. Uh, it's that he didn't he didn't sow his his oats so yeah. when 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 it was time to for him to do I've done that mm -hmm. yeah and so yeah. people start being uh, responsible too early I, I heard one tragic story from one of my relatives very old man I remember when I was like 16 I met this really mm -hmm. old guy he was somewhere in my family I don't remember what his relation was but he was like in his in his 70s and he told me that he got one job when he was 15 he got a job at this mine and he worked at that mine until he retired okay and he yeah and he he met this girl in high school and they got married and they lived together till she died and i'm thinking that here's a guy who's never been more than 40 miles from where he was born I, I could see him going, I'm not, and I'm not faulting the guy because there's not actually anything wrong with the life that he had. I just, I, I can see what that would frustrate other people. If you've only been with one woman and you've only been in one town and one job and you, how limiting is your experience? I, I'm actually not sure. I mean, at, at least to my knowledge of Immanuel Kant, I don't think he's ever left his native town. And yet he left such such a significant legacy. I mean, whether we want to take it seriously or not, that's that's another question. Well, but, that, that's why I qualify. I say I'm not yeah, saying there's anything. Yeah. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Some people some people yeah. react to that. They they wake up when they're in the mid fifties and say, they realize that hey, you know what? I never did any of the stuff that that other kids in my high school were doing. Now that I'm in my mid fifties, okay. I'm going to start doing this stuff that I should have been doing in high school. That's where you get the middle age crazy from. The the, the nostalgia kind of catching up and so forth. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I just wanted to really quickly clarify something about uh, about reincarnation because what you're saying is somewhat true, perhaps to the more Vedic traditions that do believe in a soul, that there's some sort of eternal, insubstantiated identity that crosses from a life to another of some sorts, but at least in Buddhism, that's not the case. And I mean, I'm not saying that this necessarily makes that position any more persuasive, but at least it, it works around the criticism that you were mentioning by, by virtue of saying that all sentient beings are composite. And if all these sentient beings are, comp are composite, there's this doctrine of no self such that, you know, whatever, you know, names and identification marks that we have are actually not necessarily true as far as the natural order of things is concerned. So at least in their perspective uh rebirth they they kind of try to avoid even reincarnation for similar reasons but for them rebirth kind of means that um since there was no central identity that kind of defined you know the psychophysical composition of, of that particular being then there's not there's not necessarily any sort of identification marks that carry over during the process of rebirth and that's why it's possible to kind of 
you know, not have memories from a past life because the, necessarily the information also doesn't transfer in the same way that, you know, we could think of putting a movie on a USB drive and then placing it in another computer and there's a complete intelligible and uh, similarly, sufficiently similar enough construction such that all kind of patterns and movements and so forth remain intact. So for them, that's, that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, I, I never understood the Buddhist philosophy. I mean, when somebody was trying to explain it, I was in a Theravada mm -hmm. temple and this guy was trying to explain how they didn't have a concept of the self or any of that. Uh, and he said, you can't be born again or you can't be born into a different body and reincarnated if you were never born the first time. And obviously my problem with that was that everybody in the room had a birth certificate. So what is it that you're trying to tell me? And And the very guy who said that they didn't believe in a concept of self and they didn't believe in a God. So they didn't qualify as a religion uh, because they didn't have faith-based beliefs. There was no God in the, their belief system and everything. That, yeah. that same guy moments later told me that, uh, that you, you might be a ghost for a while before you, uh, before you exist again. And I'm like, okay, so you, you don't have a concept of felt self, but you believe in you. And then you you have a new body, which means you're born again because you're born a first time because you have your birth certificate. And then he said that uh, that, that that Buddhism was not a religion because it wasn't faith based. There was no miracles. That there was no God. And and then he described the Buddha as being somebody who lives forever and who hears prayers and responds to those prayers with miracles. And I'm like, so that's exactly what a God is. And I was not welcome at the Theravada Buddhist temple anymore after that. But. Oh, man. Yeah, and my concept of, of reincarnation was very different, and this was a, this was a, a sincere belief for me. This is what I actually believed once upon a time. I I thought that I had scientific evidence for the soul, and I because of the of the, the time that I grew up, I grew up in you know, the Los Angeles area, and then in you know, late sixties, early seventies, and so there was a lot of pseudoscience woo, a lot of hippie thinking. Uh, at that time, and so everybody believed that, it, that even even skeptics, even science-minded people, still believed in you know that, that mm -hmm. there was such things as telekinesis and and uh, and sp spiritual empathy and all of this. I mean, a lot of people believed that we had souls. That's why Spock could do the mind meld, and that's why Obi Wan Kenobi could travel out of his body, all of that sort of thing. So I thought that becoming one with everything as the Buddhists are talking about. Then they're talking about like a, a biosphere. It's like if you imagine Star Wars and the force, you know, like, you know, the, the force is an energy create field, but created by all living things, right? So it's all living things in this literal biosphere that is akin to the hydrosphere, which is, you know, you're, when water evaporates and goes into the clouds and everything. So life is doing something very similar. And ashes to ashes, dust to dust when you die, right? So you return to dust. But that means that the, the dust, the only way that it could be animated to be alive is when it's integrated with this spiritual force. So that's what I thought was happening. You had a material plane and you had a spiritual plane because if it isn't already obvious, that was also when D&D &D was very popular, Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm thinking that material things, material matter is... Uh, is animated or made fluid, much like clay. When you get clay wet, now you can mold clay and make it, and now it's alive. And then when it dries out, that means that the spirit has left it, and it's now it's just this rock, right? And, and it no longer has the fluid. It is no longer malleable like life is. So that's the, that's the, the physical side of it. What's happening with the spiritual side? So you have this water that was in this clay that is your body, and now it's it's gone back to the hydrosphere. This much the same thing is as I have this, uh, this big cup of water, and I'm out in the ocean. I'm, I'm sitting in a boat in the ocean. This represents my soul. This is my life, and I'm going to return it back to the hydros to, back to the well of souls, back to the oneness that is all things. Now I can tip this tip this glass out, and my soul is now in the ocean of souls. But if I dip it right back in, right now, as soon as I do that, I'm not going to get all of me back. So I get a new a new body. This I get get this body, get this soul back in it. But it's not all of me. There's lots of other things mixed in there now too. Maybe I missed some of me, and I and I got some other things in with it. 
and I may now have uh, the my my past soul as well as the past soul uh, of a fox and and a tree and some uh, prokaryotes, you know, some amoebas and stuff like that. And all of this is uh, like mixed up. So, what would your past life memory be if this is the way that that souls are tapped into and reincarnated? And I'm embarrassed that I believed that ever at all. But it's, it's at least not as stupid as some things that some people still believe. Fair enough. At least in the Tibetan tradition of Buddhism. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not sure how collective it is as far as uh, illustrating their entire perspective. They have different schools in the same way that Christianity does and so forth. So I'm not necessarily trying to make a generalized claim. But at least I know that there is a particular branch that would say that um, the kind of uh, karmic conditions or, you know, cosmic conditions that propelled, you know, the mind from a life to another are also more uh, subject to, to change and adaptation to the current conditions, be it environmental or social or whatever else, in the very body that it's embodying. After an age threshold. So they're kind of applying some sort of hemi-demi, you know, developmental psychology. They're saying that until, you know, the toddler knows the to master language, at least through, you know, basic definitions or associations of words and so forth, those are kind of the critical periods in, in the human's capacity to recollect and absorb as much as possible from different kind of lives. And then eventually, uh, as you know, that particular human is more and more molded by their biological parents, by the social community, by the linguistic community, the more and more kind of their propensities and their beliefs and desires are relative and dispositional to uh, the, the society that they're in. And this, at least this particular notion, I find it quite compatible with uh, Richard Dawkins' story that if you're India, chances are that you're Hindu. If you're born in Europe, chances are that you're a Christian and so forth. So at least to a very weak extent, I find these two kind of notions quite compatible as far as at least describing some of the early developmental stages of, of a child. Agreed. Perhaps just some food for thought. I mean, in, in some ways, they, my, my respect towards the Buddhist tradition doesn't necessarily come from making extraordinarily sophisticated scientific or empirical claims in any way. It's just fascinating in terms of... Uh, the kind of you know epistemological and linguistic notions that they have had maybe in, in early classical India in sixth seventh century and we see quite similar results and analyses in 20th century Europe so I just think that in some ways they were ahead of their time at least as far as their capacity to describe with extraordinarily minimal empirical evidence some things you know with with quite a margin of error but at least with some things they were able to describe some things quite to an interesting accuracy to what we would consider today as truth to to scientific standards. So that's most definitely where at least I, I try to show as much sympathy as possible for those kinds of people. Although it does reach a threshold of dogmatism, as you say, because once you conceive the Buddha as some, you know, almighty figure that answers prayers and intervenes in the social world and so forth, then it runs into the same problems and is open to the same scrutiny and criticisms that the Abrahamic faith is. Yeah, and I thought it was so, a Paradox too, since yeah. Arta Gautama himself famously said that it was irrelevant whether gods existed or not. So, and now you're worshiping, basically, you're worshiping an atheist as a god. What did you do? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, there. I think that comes primarily from their, from the misrepresentation of you know early Buddhist literature, for example. Uh, at least some of you know the earlier texts, such as the Theravada ones that you might have been exposed to, or do mention the Hindu gods. For example, you know Brahma comes to the Buddha and asks him questions, or Vishnu comes and so forth. So there is some some intra-faith kind of interaction as far as the early literature is concerned. But at least to my knowledge, all traditions of Buddhism would collectively agree that one of the most significant. Uh, uh, Kind of moments when the Buddha reached enlightenment is that you know all gods of all the realms you know arrived and so forth to to hear the wisdom and whatever and then people ask him are you human no are you a god no then what are you and his response was that I am awake so he basically not only rejected his own humanity but he also rejected any sort of claim towards the existence of any deity so yeah most definitely I think that 
you know, Gautama himself might have been an atheist that was completely misunderstood in his time. Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you don't mind, just very quickly, I have a couple of questions about about politics and then we can wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. So what do you think Hitchens would have to say about Trump if you were still around? <laughs> Hitchens was a a huge enemy of the Clintons. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, I fully understand what his problem with that was. But I can't, just because you don't like the Clintons, and I didn't either, uh, doesn't mean that, you, that you're going you're gonna to like Trump. There's a lot of people that, that if they hear a criticism against Trump, they can't, they can't analyze that criticism for what it is. They have to deflect it back to Hillary. Well, what do you know? Well, what about Hillary? No, no, we're not doing what about ism. We're not talking about the person who didn't win. We're talking about the person who's actually causing policy now. And you can't blame the things that Trump is doing wrong on what you think Hillary would have done. Yeah. That doesn't change anything. And even even if even if she would have done that, that doesn't make what he's doing any less wrong. <laughs> so, I couldn't. I don't think that that uh, Hitchens could have guessed. That Trump would be elected, but if he did guess, I think that he his his prophecy on that probably would have been as accurate as the Simpsons, when the Simpsons did an episode predicting you know Trump as uh, as president, yeah. what the, the the damage that he did to the country. Now the Simpsons laid out that it was all financial damage, and we haven't seen that yet. We can see that it's coming, but we haven't seen it happen yet, and Trump supporters don't even see that it's coming. Mm -hmm. But there's there's actually much worse things that Trump is doing, like trying to get prayer back in school. Try to explain to a Trump supporter that this country was based on you know the First Amendment and the the uh, um, the, the the establishment clause of the First Amendment. You know that that Congress shall make no law even respecting the establishment of religion. Try to get them to understand what that is. Right, try to get them to understand that this country was based on secular politics, granting power to we the people, where every other country start their constitutions when they have them always declare, you know, that the Trinity or something, you know, be, you know, by the power of God, we establish this country, whatever. But the, but the United States didn't do that, it was the first country that, that gave power to the people. Mm -hmm. and, the, and believers today have no idea why that's valuable. You can see what's going on in Saudi Arabia. You can see exactly what's wrong with Saudi Arabia. But for some reason, you think that if it was a Christian country, that yeah. it would be fine. Yep. But no, <laughs> because if it is a Christian country, it's not going to be your denomination, is it? And then look at everybody else. Is if they're if you're if you're not in the if the state declares a religion, it's going to endorse that religion, and then everybody else has to pay homage. To that religion or religious denomination, mm -hmm. so that you know, so that it, it's it's hard to get a Protestant to understand when they're in the majority position. There, it's hard to get them to understand other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like um, I was in Scotland uh, a few years back, and I, I didn't want to say anything in the train because I didn't want anybody to hear an American accent mm -hmm. because they were all talking about how stupid American politics was. Mm -hmm. and what hypocrites they all were. So you have this guy from the American Family Association, you know, those people that absolutely hate gays and are advocating against abortions and everything. And then it turns out that his mistress is pregnant. So he's trying to force his mistress to get an abortion so that his wife won't find out. Oh, man. Absolute hypocrisy, right? Mm -hmm. But this is the way they are. So you know, they hate gays until they find out that their son is gay. And then if you know, only when it immediately directly affects them, do they figure out, hey, there are other people who don't have my perspective. And maybe I should be thinking about other people and not just myself. <laughs> it's a disturbing thing how we have to illustrate to people. And this is what really bothers me about politics is that politics is far less rational than religion, but it is also a bigger moral issue than religion because you're actually affecting directly people's lives it's not you know that they, they believe that they'll have this that'll happen when they die and and these people have this other belief about what will happen if they die but right now but in politics we're talking about right now while we live and what we're doing to each other 
you know, and 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 everybody's trying to, to to claim some kind of like dominant status over everyone else, and they, and they accuse me of doing the same, which I'm not doing. As an atheist activist, I am the strongest defender of the freedom of religion. Much, much better advocate of the freedom of religion than any religious leader is if they're trying to get prayer put back into schools. The reason we what we we never took prayer out of school. What we did was that we stopped teachers from forcing students of different faiths from having to pray to the teacher's God. We gave those students their right to observe their own religious traditions. I mean, and so the Jewish kids and Catholic kids and Native American kids and East Indian kids wouldn't all have to be forced to pray to the God of Lutheranism. Yeah. You know, but you get, get a Lutheran to understand that. Right. Well, if they were, if I'm in the dominant situation that everybody gets to bow to my God, well, what if what if you're in a Sharia country, and now you have to bow to Allah, and and the whole system is is rigged in favor of the Muslims, and they may let you live as long as you keep quiet and keep your subservient position, but they don't understand. If they're in the majority, then we we just all have to bow to them. That's the worst attitude that I ever see in politics, which I see rampant throughout of it. I got mine. Fuck everybody else. I'm going to impose my will on everyone else. And, and sadly, that's what these people think I'm doing. And it's really not. Yeah. I, I agree. It's a, it's a complete misconstruction on, on their part about what, what's the relationship between their belief and the actual kind of social practices of, of governance and freedoms of expression and so forth. I, I just don't think that they understand the extent to which they're their beliefs justify a more totalitarian government where the you know the majority would always have the ability to impose their beliefs and their system of rituals over everybody else and the kind of you know injustices that come about with kind of applying that and i think there's just such, such an inner conflation there between you know on one hand you know them being so proud about their constitution and constitutional values even though they likely you know don't really know what some of the implications of those things are and not only do they not, not know they're yeah. run, they're running roughshod over it donald yeah. trump has done everything in his power to yeah. do, to undermine or or eliminate the first amendment every provision therein the establishment clause by by setting up you know putting prayer back in school he's violating the establishment clause by trying to do his muslim ban then he's violated the prohibition clause uh, at standing rock we got to see him challenge uh, the ability to peaceably assemble because he pushed that that uh, that pipeline through uh, and, and made it illegal for protesters to. I mean, we have our First Amendment right to peacefully assemble our grievances unless it's a commercial venture, and now we no longer have that right. If it's a commercial venture, venture we're fucked. So they they just took it away by provisions, just like Orwell's Animal Farm. They take it away in provisions in tiny slices, so that you never really notice when it's gone. Which is why Animal Farm was a, a, a brilliant piece of literature. Entirely yep. parable, but brilliant. Yep, step by step, baby step. So the, the changes are noticeable up to the point where you accum if you accumulate all of them and you put them together, then you can really trace the, the significance and the impact to which. Yeah, and, and then also the freedom of, of the press is another one. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, Trump wants to be able to sue people who make negative, negative comments, sue reporters for making negative comments about him. So they, this is the, how dictators behave. This is not how the president of a free country behaves. Mm -hmm. This is another violation of the First Amendment. And yeah. then of course, freedom of speech, we get the same thing. So he he's really advocating against every provision of the First Amendment. And he doesn't really believe in the Second Amendment either. And the Second Amendment is in a whole other ball of wax because nobody understands that correctly. And yeah. Yeah, I realize I'm being arrogant for saying that I do, but I honestly think that I do. <laughs> I can put in a I can put in a strong argument that this is what the the founding fathers meant. And so when people argue that that we weren't supposed to have, you know, back in the days of muskets, we were all supposed to defend ourselves, apparently against the government if if need be, with our muskets. We were never expected to have military weapons, but mm -hmm. it's not the way the Constitution reads. It says that that you know the government having a well-organized militia, the right to bear arms will not be abridged. 
What does that mean? It means that we, what is a militia? A militia is a military force made of common people. Mm -hmm. this, was, this was written before there was an army. So if the militia is made of common people, then we have to have military weapons because we are the militia. Mm -hmm. And that's why we all need to have our AK-47s and AR-15s. Now, if now that we have the most overbloated military anybody ever had, and we completely don't need it, Mm -hmm. we, maybe we need to reevaluate that. Do we want to go back to militia and have everybody keep their machine guns and maybe spend all of that military money on infrastructure? That's an idea. We could do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And that way we have home defense and we're not in everybody else's business all stealing their oil. Yeah. I'm not really happy with my country right now. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's not many reasons to be, at least until he gets voted out or something. But yeah. I mean, well, we, we, we've been a problem for a lot longer than Trump. Right. Yeah. And, we, and the more you find out about our, our political history, and I was, I was blissfully ignorant all throughout the eighties. You know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't care about politics and everything. And, and I'm, I'm almost woeful now that the, 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 the everything that I learn is things that America did wrong. Mm -hmm. And there are people that have this attitude. If you want to be a patriot, you have to always think about the things that America does right and never ignore or, or conceal. Texas State Board of Education made a statement that they wanted to conceal everything that America did wrong so that nobody would know that America did anything wrong because they wanted America to be seen as a shining beacon of what it means to be God-blessed. Yep. Which means you want to lie yep. to students. And if you want to know how bad things can get, just look at how bad things have already been. Mm -hmm. We want to know why well, our government wouldn't do that. Oh, well, yeah, our government did that. Just look back 20, 30, 50 years, whatever, to the whatever instance we're talking about. Yeah, our government did all these terrible things. And so if it did it before, it can do it again. And this is what you need to know if you want to be, if you want to be patriotic. If you, if you really want to believe in your country, you also have to control that country. Mm -hmm. You have to be aware of the, the horrible things that it has done and can do again. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, given yeah, that right now we're doing nothing but yeah. horrible things. <laughs> right. I mean, the American defense budget is is higher than the next nine countries in top ten put together. So yeah. I'm I'm definitely unsure to what extent this this ridiculous spending on unnecessary. And the sad and, thing is, uh, what made us a great country? I mean, if uh, people will argue that we were never quite great, and I get the argument that, but what what made us the envy of other nations was that we had once the highest standard of living because we had the most robust middle class, mm -hmm. and now we're we're throwing all that out. We had secularism. We were the ones, meaning that we we were the ones that it didn't matter what your religious background was. You mm -hmm. could come to this country, and it didn't matter if you were Shia or Sunni. It didn't matter. You know, if you, what caste you were back in India doesn't exist here. Here, it's, it's a meritocracy. Here it comes down to what can you do? You know, mm -hmm. do you have the talent given this opportunity where your background and your religious belief don't matter? Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what I thought made America great. Yeah. We, we, were the, we were the great melting pot where you could come and do this. Well, now we've, got, of course, gone against everything. That ironically, the, the, the make of great America great again, people have taken away everything that made America great. Mm -hmm. Let's make America a shithole third world country is what the goal is now. We'll have yeah. an economy. We'll have a great economy for about 20 more minutes. Yeah. For our over, the, the, we've, we've raised the deficit to 50% higher than it was when Trump took office. This is like borrowing your way out of debt, isn't it? Right. You get this initial sugar rush in the economy of, because of, the, of, of you know you, you give a tax break to the, the corporations who don't pay taxes, and so now they buy back their own um, their own stocks and everything. And so you get a you get an initial sugar rush, and then it all comes down, mm -hmm. and we know that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It happens at the end of every Republican. Uh, uh, term we, we we get the we get the democrat comes in because they've been alternating you know eight eight years for republican eight years for democrat alternating and so they keep trying to do that trickle down economics which has never and can never work 
Mm -hmm. And so that, that it, it keeps doing this cycle. And then the Dems come out and by the end of the, the that eight year term, okay, but well they finally undone the damage and now it's getting better again. And then the Republican comes back and let's do trickle down economics and only, and only cater to the rich people and fuck all the poor people. And this they do in the name of family values. Yeah, I mean, I think it's quite hilarious. I believe it was Trump at some point in the 70s or the 80s. He said the economy always does better under Democrats and that he's going to vote Democrat because he knows that his businesses are going to succeed better. So I think it's quite ironic how he's spinning all these things. And I don't even know what to make out of it. The thing about Trump is yeah. that you can, you, I've seen so many videos. I'm sure you probably have too, where you, yeah. you take a Trump from five years ago and play this, play this, compared to something Trump said yesterday and there's contradicting himself and it's not just one or two times. It's like I've seen long videos where you can just have an argument with Trump where Trump contradicts Trump on like every point. Yeah. And, and so you, you go back and watch Bernie, for example, you go back and watch Bernie from like 1981 or 1988. Doesn't matter. He's saying the same things he said <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and Trump is just, can't remember what the hell lie he told yesterday. He's going to tell a different one today. Yeah. So five times in in one or two years, he said nobody's ever seen a Category 5 hurricane, knowing that everybody's seen a Category 5 hurricane, and so has he seen a Category 5 hurricane, but he's going to keep repeating the same lie because why ratings? He thinks it sounds like a clever story. He thinks everybody's stupid. Mm -hmm. the hell? But I think there's some super interesting consistency also where Trump himself pulled a Simpson prediction. I saw this on Trevor Noah's show. I think he said at some point that during either Bush 2 or the Obama administration where he said the president is going to invade Iran to find a reason for re-election. And then he does it himself. And I just think it's so hilarious that he... You know, yeah, because his popularity was so low that he knew he would never win the election unless he did this distraction, the, the wag yep. the dog thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and where did the wag the dog thing come from? That came from Clinton mm -hmm. doing something similar. So we, we know it, it doesn't mean, it, I don't want to say it doesn't matter. We, we know that, you know, Dems lie too, you know, especially if we're talking about the Clintons, both of them did. Uh, so I was never a huge fan mm -hmm. of, of Bill Clinton. Um, I take, I, I do a judgment. It's not like, you know, okay, so this person belongs to my political party. That means that he's a godsend. And this person is the other one, so that means that he's abhorrent and evil. You know, I, I try to weigh the, po the positives and the negatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could say something positive about George W. Bush. At, at he was an idiot and a liar, and he caused a lot of people to die over war crimes. But at the same time, he was a personable guy that people seemed to like. And he never embarrassed his family by having an extra with a, an extramarital affair, right? Mm -hmm. So I can say something nice about him. Richard Nixon was evil and a liar and did cause a whole lot more people to die than, than most people in America know. Most people don't, don't realize how much evil uh, um, Nixon did. Mm -hmm. You have to go back and watch, um, well, I, don't, I won't get into it, but... Other, other, never mind. <laughs> I'll just leave that alone. Uh, uh, Nixon was evil. And yet I could still say that Nixon was clever. He was that. I can say something positive. But we get to Trump. I got nothing. Yeah. No, not just Trump. It, it, it's a unique time in my life. I've got, there's two. There's two that have no good qualities whatsoever. There's not a positive thing. I, anyone could honestly say about either of these guys, Trump and McConnell. I'm sure you can toss in Mike Pence in there also. <sighs> Mike Pence, yeah. he's not in that same category. Okay. Mike Pence is a liar and he's delusional. And I would love to, you know, to, to, to be in an elevator with Mike Trump Pence where it accidentally gets, you know, the power goes out and we're stuck between floors for a good hour. That would be that would be good. Where you can't get the fuck away. We're gonna have a discussion, Mister Pence. That would be great. I would love that because he's such a shithead. I mean, he he's the things that he makes believe, things he lies to himself about. I would love to the opportunity to impart some truth on his ass. But he's not in the same category as Trump or McConnell. Mm -hmm. McConnell does not care about 
humanity. He doesn't care about anything but himself mm -hmm. and his own power. And to a large degree, Trump does too. He just puts on a better show than McConnell does. I mean, R McConnell can't even get his his human skin over his reptilian you know, frame very well. I mean, <laughs> we can still tell that's a turtle under there. Uh, Trump is, uh, but neither of them, neither of them have a good quality at all. Trump cares about nothing, loves nothing, mm -hmm. lies about everything. I mean, lies in every single sentence he ever speaks so that it, it becomes an issue. We have to wonder seriously, has he ever said anything that was honest or truthful or correct ever in his life or that wasn't in some way a dig against somebody else? There's not, there's no good quality, nothing. He's, he's absolutely incompetent. He's literate. He, he, I'm going to stop. Yeah. <laughs> Just going to stop. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I'm not sure if this is necessarily a compliment or Trump, but what I find interesting about him is that he, he came with the promise and the story that he's going to drain the swamp in some way. And, you know, at least, at least to outsiders and uh, of, of the United States, it does seem that the the american media is basically an oligopoly or a monopoly of some sorts where the vast majority of news channels are owned by perhaps one or two corporates so that's that, correct. That, all right so so you know trump sort of resisting the establishment i mean technically to his promise he's delivering right he is i mean not necessarily in a democratic way but at least he's contesting uh what he what he said he was going to do he's kind of criticizing the way media outlets are portraying you know political instances when he said he was going to drain the swamp yeah. we, we 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 were supposed to believe that he was going to to get out the corruption and it we have instead the most corrupt administration we have ever had and that's why his cabinet uh, are so many of them are under investigation or have already been charged or are already in prison. The US of his own lawyers are in prison or under investigation right now, much to say nothing of his advisors and so forth. Yeah. I mean, most of them haven't lasted too long and they kind of, you know, folded their cars before they had the chance to. Yeah, to get into the troubles. Those are the ones that got kicked out quick. Well, yeah. except uh, I think Flynn was was out pretty quick, but and still went to jail because. So he drained the swamp by filling it full of crooks. You can't get best of both worlds, I suppose. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I would I would have preferred that you know somebody that had a hum humanitarian concern, somebody that was that somebody that loved things and had interests and was in some sense human and had maybe a real a real sense of humor. Trump doesn't have. Trump is a, it, it, like everybody says when when they say okay, well he has a malignant narcissistic personality disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, I needed psychiatrists to tell me that. <laughs> It'd yeah. be more obvious. This is the most thin-skinned guy who lies about everything just to make sure that he never, ever, ever admits when he's wrong. So it's yeah. amazing to me that the evangelical community adores him. He's broken every commandment and bragged about broken every commandment, and he's broken every commandment more than once. Yeah. I mean, every one of them, including that one, he broke that one more than once. And he has no no compassion or concern or or human qualities, and then then he tells people on the news. He says, "Why should I ask forgiveness for God when I've never done anything wrong?" Mm -hmm. How could any evangelical pretend to hold the position that they pretend to hold, and yet still say that he is their godsend and he's the most biblical president and all of that crap? It's because they're all making bank on his ass over his corruption. That's what that's all about. Yep. Makes sense, but I have my hopes up for 2020. And we'll yeah, see where it goes. Lot. Okay. A lot. Even even if we even if we if we if, if we get him out and we get McConnell out and Lindsay out and, and all of those fucking reptiles out of out of out of the Congress, the damage that's already been done to the court system, to, to replacing, uh, to, to having justices that are all uh, right-wing ideologues, Christian nationalists, dominionists, 
that's going to do an awful lot of damage to our country. And the only hope that I have beyond that is that we will go the way of Ireland. I'm crossing my fingers. You know, Ireland was a was a heavily religious state, tried to impose a, and even enforce a blasphemy law. But none of that worked because the more you tried to, to tighten the control, the religious control, the more the, the government, the people became secular. So the government is entirely religious and the people are entirely secular. And here in the United States, we have, we're trying to have a secular government, but the people, because of waves, waves of, 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 uh, of uh, what is it, those evangelical awakenings or whatever, the uh, series of awakening movements, they've turned everybody into an evangelical believer. And now nobody has any, any idea since on how to on how to protect our secular government. So we're going to have to turn the government religious before the religious people wake up and realize, well that was stupid. Look what we did to ourselves. That's that's it looks like it's going to take that. Hmm. I haven't been into the US in a while, but I, I would try to at least have a more optimistic picture, not necessarily maybe on some of the other social issues that are going on in the US, but um I'm I'm not sure if if I'm as equally concerned with the religiosity wave kind of taking over. It still seems that insofar as you know, churches cannot be taxed and so on. They do have a lot of leeway into into politics and so on. But you know, I would hope that there there's there's sufficient kind of momentum in in the Democratic Party to not let that happen in any way. At least not at the federal level. And you know, with the Tenth Amendment, there's still a lot of leeway for states to do whatever they want, and we clearly see this in you know texts and museums with Jesus riding dinosaurs and whatever else. So, so th there's always, I feel, going to be that leeway for states to kind of have a higher input that the federal government cannot restrict or constrain in any way. So I'm just really hoping that the federal government, at least at that level, is going to stay more intact and more disposed and disposable towards these sorts of thinking. But one of the concerns that I really do share with you is is on the Supreme Court because those positions are permanent and those positions are for life. And we, we've seen with Kavanaugh the kind of disaster and you know unethical behavior and conduct that somebody at that parity can have and yet still manage to get one of the most powerful office in the United States and be able to impact you know million, hundreds of millions in lives and you know, it's just so disgusting and disappointing for us to be able to uh, to allow that to happen without any sort of other ethical mechanisms that would back that up. And even when Kavanaugh was asked about those things, it's not like he made his defense any more clear than or tolerable or forgivable or whatever else you can imagine. I, you know, it's like he is basically he whatever it was. It's it's what it is, and I think that's the more difficult aspect of it if we so, if yeah. we win the election this time uh, and and trump is no longer in office we can be reasonably sure that he will go to prison because he's on charges from new york state for which pence cannot uh, um, pardon him so when when trump is removed he will be removed <laughs> will be put away not that that does anybody any good anymore it would you know, at that point as long as he's not in power i uh, who who cares you know he we would it was shown his ass he would have shown what he is and so there's no there's no value in vengeance but while he is in power we need to do everything we can to get him out or or to to, to limit the damage he's doing because what he what he just did with soleimani for example i mean they're all you know, they're all arguing that, you know, that that we were trying to defend Soleimani, which was not the case. You know, Trump tr tr Trump targeted somebody else in Yemen at the same time, in such a way that it was clear that he wasn't trying to um, he wasn't trying to stem any imminent threat. He wanted to start a war. He wanted to start a war because Pompeo and a number of others want to get Jesus back. They want to bring on the end times. So they needed a war that would be supported by Israel. And when Israel didn't support this, that's why Trump had to de-escalate. Yeah, I think the situation in, in Yemen is actually quite complicated also, particularly since the Saudi families have been involved there for you know decades and decades of 
trying to annex Yemen or make it somehow part of the Saudi family. And and we've seen what Trump did to the Saudis when they visited DC. It's like the billions and billions of you know military aid and what have you. And it's just disgusting how you know one of the most powerful militaries in the world can bow to you know people that have oil that have accessible oil and and, and so forth. I, yeah. That, that that just really speak, speaks also to the disgust, I guess, to the environment and what we're doing to it, and that you know our current political system, whether American or elsewhere, chances are it's that it's not really salvaging much of what could potentially be salvageable from the environmental chaos that we've caused. Yeah, the the environment is actually my 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 top priority, and I've been deliberately not talking about that because it just I I want this to be on a high note. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. I feel you. All right. Then I, I have just a couple of more questions and, okay. and we, we can wrap it up. So um, you see, th th at least my belief is that the way we can improve the American public educational system, and I'm talking here K through 12, not necessarily collegiate in any way, is by teaching people to think critically, is by teaching people to be skeptical. I can find more interesting content on YouTube, such as yourself or somebody else's in, in the same kind of umbrella that, that can help me kind of criticize and critically think about some notions, be it about religion, be it about science or something else in between. And, and this component is definitely lacking in one of the most important institutions that shapes everybody's minds and, you know, ability to interact with society. So how do you think we can teach children to be more skeptical? How do you think schools can teach, you know, young minds to, to not always believe whatever is being fed to them as facts and be able to question for themselves these sorts of things? That's that's an yeah. How do we how do we cause people to be innately curious? They're innately curious anyway. Religion is imposed specifically to to thwart that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's the problem. That's why I'm an anti theist. Mm, okay. When you weigh those positives and negatives, then we see that that religion is a net negative on the, over the course of the entirety of human history. And this is even when we're talking about only re intrinsic religiosity. That, too, is, it relates to the very thing that you're talking about right now, mm -hmm. where it debilitates people's ability to reason or distinguish truth from fiction. So when it, this innate, uh, it, this intrinsic religiosity actually causes people to believe literal fairy tales, and not just the ones in the Bible, but other fairy tales, too. You know, children are told these uh, these outlandish stories, and if they come from a deeply religious background, they can't tell what stories are true and which ones aren't. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if if you tell me that, that well, I, we don't need to get into the in, into the specifics. I'm sure everybody can come up with their hypothetical situation of things that you know. If the story included this element, well, that would be the thing you wouldn't believe. You you, you believe all of these other reasonable things. And then he turned into an elephant and flew away. Okay, well, I'm not going to believe that. But intrinsically religious person, child, would. Do you think there's any hope for the educational system to sort of... Religion is in, is in steady decline. At least yeah. uh, Christianity is certainly in decline in every state uh, and has been for a while. Atheism mm -hmm. is on the rise in every state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, uh, in this case, we need to advocate for skepticism, and we need to advocate for rationalism, not just that we don't believe something. We, we, we want to have values don't come from atheism, they come from humanism. You know, our, our rationality comes from, you know, being skeptics. You know, there, there are other attributes uh, that, that, that cause us to be atheists, but atheism yeah. doesn't, isn't the thing in itself. Atheism. Yeah. Atheism is not a thing in itself. All that means is that I don't believe your bullshit story. Uh, we we have to have other means of you know wh where where are our values coming from? We have objective mm -hmm. morality. We actually do. If we if we can understand what morality is, we have a universal agreement on what this definition is and when and how and the criteria to determine objectively mm -hmm. whether something is moral or not. Right? We can do that. Where religion doesn't, religion just tells you that you know whatever is moral or immoral is according to the whim of whoever's pretending to speak for the god. Mm -hmm. That's subjective, and even if the god existed, 
that would still be subjective. It's still God's opinion. Mm -hmm. We don't have a criteria. In order to be objective, we have to have a criteria for how do we tell whether something is moral or not. And I think we've got that. You know, it wasn't all that hard to put to put together either. I mean, that's why humans wrote all these laws centuries before the supposed Ten Commandments were never really given. I think I went off into the weeds again. You asked me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, tell, last question. Tell me about twenty twenty elections and why do you think Bernie's going to win? Uh, it was. It, I, I got a moment of hope when. Okay. Donald Trump tweeted something the other day. He says, you know, Bernie is rising in the polls. And he's trying to be alarmist. So Trump says, you know, Bernie's rising in the polls. What does that mean? And uh, Bernie's tweet back was, it means you're going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And uh, that, it, that yeah. empowered me. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, the, the world has gone mad. Yeah. I, I've lost friends i've lost family there are so many people that won't speak to me now that they were they could tolerate that i didn't that i didn't believe in god but they couldn't tolerate that i wouldn't worship the orange god oh and so yeah the the, the political division that is that has come since the the trump election is just crazy and i i feel utterly naive that back in 2015 i thought i thought that bernie was going to win that and I thought I was very hopeful about a lot of things. I was, I was like, we're, we're actually going to start turning around the, the damage that we're doing to the climate. We're actually going to be investing in green gen, green energy. There's so much we can do. We have the technology. There's other, All we have to do is have the will. right? We have the technology to make everything better for everybody, and we can do it, and we know how to do it. And we elected Trump. And now we're just going to have to all eat shit sandwiches. <laughs> we die. Just, I, we had an option to make shit better. Yep. And instead, everybody turned into praising Nazis. Nazis are a thing now. Again, so apparently. And if they're not Nazis, well, then they're they're Christian nationalists, right? Well, that's, I'm pretty people. sure that's what they thought they were doing also back in 1940s Germany. I'm pretty sure they were. Exactly. Were they also Germany. Christian nationalists? Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, and, and nobody knows who the fucking enemy is. They think that this is an issue of left versus right, and they don't know what either of these things mean. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the sad thing is, is it's not even a left versus right issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Trump has been pushing, Trump has been pushing uh, on occasion socialist policies that are not recognized as socialists. The, the issue is authoritarian versus anti-authoritarian. Nobody understands that either, because the word for anti-authoritarian is libertarian, which is an exclusively right-wing political party in this country. So nobody knows that when we're saying libertarian, we're not talking about them. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's... Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I'm, I'm sure socialism is, is having the same sort of problems, right? Where, you know, it's like there there's two picks, and then, you know, socialism has such a broad sort of... You know, that, that dichotomy of thinking yeah. where it has to be one or the other on everything, right? You've got yeah. to be all bad, you've got all good. There's nobody, it's like you have to be gay or straight, right? Well, it turns out there's a bit more nuance there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it turns out that not everybody's up in either extreme either, that most people are in the bell curve. We're all down here. Most of us are down here. There's very few that are pure this or pure that. But, but who, who thinks like that anymore? So socialism versus capitalism, runaway capitalism, is currently demonstrating itself to be a much worse system than, than pure socialism would be. Pure capitalism just destroys the entire planet for its mm -hmm. own profit, and mm -hmm. we see exactly how that's happening. Mm -hmm. But if we had socialist policies and capitalist policies locked in an embrace, that would cause a balance to which we have the advantages of both, and it's not... It's not the kind of compromise that some people might think it is. I mean, we're we're offering we're offering policies. We we have police force and roads, and and things that the libertarians want to pretend that they wouldn't wouldn't need, right? We would have some things that are they're being offered by the, <laughs> the socialist systems, but we also yeah. have, we still have currency and we still have free market because you know the, the socialists in this country are still advocating a market economy like they have in in Denmark, for example. Yeah. yeah. 
So everybody's alarmist and they're all scared of things that they're, it's not even the issue. And the sad thing is, is I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with like, what, 20 million people out of 320 million people that, that actually know what the problems are. Mm hmm yeah it's always having to pick one of two but i think another problem with the american system is that corporates are now entities right like we are an oligarchy yeah america is like the beacon of the capitalist haven where we literally interpret the law in such a way that buildings and money-making machines are considered people and sentient and they can you know have the same kind of protections and of rights and duties and whatever else right like Elections are bought. I'm pretty sure that Bernie got completely, you know, outspent by Hillary in the DNC. There must have been some internal matter there, because at least in my understanding, Bernie was supposed to take the nomination in 2016, and then maybe we wouldn't have been in the hurdle that we are today. Yeah. There. Well, yeah, my 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 friends who voted for Hillary uh, want want to deny every suspicion that I have about that. So, I mean. Even the things that were publicly announced and that the DNC even admitted, you know, I'm, I'm considered a conspiracy theorist for pointing out these things that, that they admitted publicly. Mm. So I'm just going to okay. leave that alone. Anyway, I don't, I don't, did we have any more questions? No, nope, that, that was it. All right. Well, very good. Um, had fun talking to you uh, and I'm going to have to let you go, but. Same. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And it was a fantastic discussion. It was great to actually, you know, see one of my, uh, the, my idols of, you know, childhood, childhood upbringing and, you know, see you live. I'm, I'm still a huge fan of yours. I'm sorry. I just, I just had to say it, but okay. you know, I definitely admire your work and thank you for the content that you're putting out and it's extraordinarily educational. And yeah, I hope it, it reaches a broader access so more people learn, you know, I appreciate that very much, sir. Oh, there go the dogs. <laughs> but, yeah. All right. Talk to you later, sir. Bye-bye. Yep. Take care. Bye.